topic this morning is walking in wisdom. I was thinking about these, this whole chapter of Ephesians chapter 5, and it's all about the Christian walk. We're talking to walk in love in the beginning. We talked about walk uh, as uh, in the light. And then this morning, uh, we're talking about walking in wisdom. So it's all about the Christian walk. You know, as a young man, I had the opinion that knowledge and wisdom were equal. They meant the same thing. A wise person simply knows more than other people. Therefore, you know, if you carry that to its logical conclusion, the, the pathway to wise living and having solved all the problems is education. If we just know enough. All the problems can be solved by having the correct information. Well, I've come to realize that that idea is bogus, proven by the fact that although we have more information today than we ever have had before, we seem to have more problems, and solutions seem to escape us. Rather, true wisdom is defined as living life from God's perspective. A wise person is one who lives life with that outlook. What does God want? A great English preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said this about wisdom. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There's no fool so great as the knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. So wisdom is the application of knowledge. You know, I was raised in a church very much like this one. And as a result, I grew up knowing a lot about the Bible. I had all the answers. If the questions were right, if the questions were about people, or places or events in the New or Old Testament, I had the answers. I even knew a few of the principles of Scripture, like do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you, or uh, love God and love your neighbor. You know, those those were big principles that I knew about. I didn't always print, uh, didn't always practice them, but I did know about them. So armed with a head full of information, I headed off to college to gain more information. And two and a half years later, I had taken many classes. I had written many papers. I had passed multitudes of exams, but I wasn't any wiser. My life was filled with inner turmoil. And the reason was that it was caused between the the lifestyle of those around me and the lifestyle of what I knew God desired for me, the lifestyle called the Bible. I found myself conforming to the ways of the world. And although I wasn't by God's grace rejecting my faith, I was filled with frustration and guilt. In March of my junior year at the University of Missouri, I God graciously intervened. He brought me into contact with some Christians who truly uh, demonstrated the reality of their faith, not just in what they knew but in how they acted. I was attracted to the vitality of their lives. They spoke openly and boldly about Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord. Now, I knew about the Savior part, because I accepted Christ when I was about 10 years old. I never really seriously doubted he was in my life, but I was confused on how to live as Christ wanted me to live, how to overcome these inner frustrations, how to overcome temptation. And I was very interested in what they had to say about power for living the Christian life. In March of 1970, in the Student Union of the University of Missouri, I listened for the first time, and I probably heard it, but there, you know, we all know there's a difference between listening and hearing. I 
hear things, but do I really listen? But I really listen to what God's Word said about the filling of the Holy Spirit. It was kind of an odd sort of comfort to realize there was a classification for Christians like myself. I fit into the category spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 of the carnal Christian. Paul said this. He said, And our brethren could not speak to you as the spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. In fact, you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. And since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? Paul was saying, I look at you, Corinthians, and I don't see a whole lot of difference between you and a non-believer. You are walking like mere men. And you should be walking in a way that is different. Walking in the light. Walking in love. Walking in wisdom. And I realized at that time that I had been in control of my own life. God was only a minor interest to me. Now, he wanted to be Lord of my life. Not just Savior, but Lord. Lord of everything. And at that time, I was ready to hear the truth. Right there in front of God in the world, I confessed my sin of self-control. Asked God to fill me with his Holy Spirit. I can genuinely say that that decision was a turning point in my life. It began a transformation of my life which has continued for over 40 years. And God took a self-centered, proud, worldly 21-year-old and began to change him. And the truth is what I want to share with you today. Turn to Ephesians 5, verse 15. And let me read through verse 21. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making those to your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine for that dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Lord, what a rich, what a rich passage. It begins talking about how wise men walk in the light. Be careful how you walk. One of the truths about the Christian life is that we are to be as aliens. Peter said in the second chapter of his epistle, first epistle, Behold, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Lusts. Uh, having trouble speaking this morning, which wage war against the soul. Because of sin, this world system is broken. Absolutely and utterly broken. Dark forces rule over the system. Over planet Earth. You know, I heard a story that came out of... Uh, the events of 9-11, the World Trade Center destruction. It said that engine company number six was trapped when building two collapsed. After the dust cleared, a shaft of sunlight reached into the stairwell, which was their refuge. Only after the darkness passed could they begin to move. And they had to climb over a strange landscape of mountains of jagged metal and debris, all covered with fine dust, which made everything very slippery. The going was extremely slow and dangerous. And I think that's an excellent example of what life is like for the Christian 
who really want to walk in a wise way. The world is broken, it's twisted, the culture is twisted, and we have to be very careful. Dangers all around us, we have to take great care of how we walk, rather than living as fools. And often, as did engine company number six, we've got to wait patiently until the dust settles and the light of God's guiding presence shines through. What does walking in wisdom mean? Walk in wisdom. Well, one area is seen in the context. In these previous verses that we covered last week about walking in purity, walking and understanding the immorality that's in our, in our culture, a particularly dangerous area in immoral behavior, not just out there, but affecting each one of us with temptations, walking in the light rather than darkness. Paul's also told us that we should walk in love, following the example of Jesus. He adds in verse 16, the need, making the most of your time. The wise person is making the most of his time. Or redeeming the time, as another translation puts it. The word used for time is not the word for hours and minutes or for the passing of time. But it's telling us, Paul is not telling us to get better organized how we use our time or be better managers or, or to keep good lists and good calendars. Now that's not bad advice, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the larger concept of taking advantage of opportunities, making the most of the opportunities. The same word is used in Colossians 4, 5, where it says, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. The context here is speaking how we relate to the world around us, to non-believers specifically. And the reason we take advantage of opportunities is because the days are evil. <coughs> the foolish Christian lives with himself at the center of his universe. Decisions are made from the perspective of his own self-interest and what's good for him and perhaps for his family. He only sees the surface of life and people. He may try to isolate himself from contact with others, never realizing that by doing so, so he exposes his self and expresses his selfish nature. He enters through life with little recognition of what God has a purpose, that God has a purpose for his life. And he looks forward to heaven. Now listen to me here. He looks forward to heaven only because it's going to be paradise filled with more pleasure and personal benefit for himself. He eats, sleeps, recreates, raises the family, saves for his retirement, never realizing God's purpose for his life is to make the use of every opportunity to bring glory to God and share God's love with others. And he wastes his life living as a fool. That's the way of the carnal Christian. And that's the way of the world. And that's why Paul could say, I look at you and I don't see much difference. By contrast now, as verse 17 says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand that God has a will. God has a plan. God has a plan for each one of our lives. Understanding in the understand the will of the Lord means to live thoughtfully and reflectively. It's examining what we do, seeking to find God's will in all things. And like verse 10 says, we're to be constantly testing and evaluating what we do to see if it's pleasing to the Lord. That's that verse that says, trying to do what pleases the Lord. It means to evaluate your life, examine your life. As I reflect on those years before I allowed and learned how to let Christ control my life, or even had a desire to let him do that, I see I had little interest in what God's will was for my life. In fact, I can, I can specifically think about and remember that when I was considering what I was going to do with my life, I put what God wanted out of my mind. I wouldn't even think about it. 
because I was convinced that he would want me to do something that I didn't want to do. A wise Christian understands God's will is an extension of his love. He made each one of us. He made you with the desires and the talents and the gifts that you have. The situation where you are in life is where he puts you. And he wants to use those gifts to his glory. His will is good for each one of us. Now, Satan then wants to believe that. That's one of the lies of Satan. Paul continues in verse 18 to illustrate a cornerstone of God's will. In fact, I would say one of the most important cornerstones. The wisest choice we can make is to allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives. In other words, to be filled with the Spirit. Verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. We have a contrast here. A comparison made between the way that alcohol would control a person who is intoxicated and a believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can see the, the, the comparison there. To be controlled by something. Now don't overlook the idea in this verse that intoxication is foolish and is totally without any positive value. Such behavior is destructive and it's worthless. But by contrast, the filling of the Holy Spirit is of ultimate positive value and worth. Now earlier in this letter, Paul has told us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, signifying possession, authority, and security. We all receive the indwelling Holy Spirit when we are converted, when we accept Christ, when we commit our lives to Christ. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Each person is. Jesus promised this in John 17, or John 6, 16, 7. But I tell you the truth, it's your advantage that I go away. For if I go, do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? The Holy Spirit permanently indwells each believer. Bottom line truth, the Holy Spirit indwells a believer. But if you're like me, I knew that much about the Holy Spirit. What I didn't know was that the choice I had was to allow Him to control my life. He doesn't just take over unless we allow Him to do so. The issue is control. There are several reasons why the average Christian is not filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. The first of those is it may be lack of knowledge. I was part of my problem. I knew the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost more than the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, it was kind of the ethereal something floating out here. I didn't, didn't know much about the Holy Spirit. And perhaps you've never really grasped and listened. You know, maybe you've heard but not listened. That was my problem. And we're in the process of fixing that right now. It may be because of unbelief linked, linked to fear. You may be afraid Listen to me. You may be afraid of what God may ask you to do if you give Him full control of your life. That was my problem. Mixed with ignorance of, of knowing by filling the Holy Spirit, I just knew that God was going to ask me to be a preacher. My idea of what I wanted in my life, I was going to in my degree in forestry, I was going to live in the woods and I was going to hunt and fish the rest of my life. That was my perfect life. Another reason we might not be filled with the Spirit is that there might be sin in a person's life that he doesn't want to give up. They don't want to deal with it. 
It might be an issue of pride. It might be an issue of unforgiveness. Or it might be immorality or a love of the world and what the world offers. But anything that stands between you and God is an idol. And we know what God thinks about idolatry. Some or all these reasons may be standing between any person and God's best. So how do you turn over the control of your life to the Holy Spirit? How can you be filled with the Spirit? We're to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is a person, fully God. Guard against the idea that we have this some of this reservoir within us that the that the Holy Spirit fills like water fills a jar. We're speaking of the Spirit controlling us completely as a person. He is fully God, controlling our mind and our emotions and our will. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, understand these things. First, there's got to be proper heart preparation. But we have a choice to allow the Spirit controlling our life. Although it's clearly God's will that we be controlled by the Holy Spirit, that we be filled. And although it's the normal Christian life to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, we still retain the ability to reject His control. That's a choice that God gives us. That's part of what you might might, uh, say is free will. We can reject God's control of our life. We, we know that very well, don't we? We choose often to sin. A lot of times it's not just we fall in temptation. It's that we choose. I would refer to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. You've got to have a desire for the Holy Spirit to control your life. We're speaking of attitude and desire. And the Spirit's filling begins with the desire for it to happen. Another prerequisite for filling of the Holy Spirit is the confession of all known sin. The Spirit is quenched and grieved by sin. He's not going to control your life if you're quenching and grieving him. And while we while we're continuing to hang on to that sin, refusing to confess and repent, the Holy Spirit cannot fill us. Contemplate the meaning of him being the Holy Spirit. Often we speak of the Spirit that is holy, the Holy Spirit. Either a sinful self or the Spirit of God is in control, one or the other. We're either in control of ourselves or the Spirit's in control. It's our choice, but realize what our choice, if we reject the filling of the Holy Spirit, what that leads to. It leads to continued turmoil, conflict, and frustration. And lack of power. Remember what uh, what Jesus told the disciples there in the in the uh, first part of Acts. He said that you shall receive the Holy Spirit when He comes upon you. You shall receive power. Power for what? Power to be my witnesses. How are you a witness? Well, we do it in our words, but also in our lives. The power to live comes from the Holy Spirit. The power to realize all that God has for us comes through the Holy Spirit. The power to resist temptation comes through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, unless I go, the Holy Spirit can't come. The Holy Spirit came, and He dwells each believer. But we have a choice. Are we going to allow Him control or not? A third step. After the desire for it, the seeking after the Holy Spirit, speaking after seeking after righteousness, and confessing sin, any known sin, 
by the way, just depend on the Holy Spirit to reveal sin to you. We don't have to go digging around and trying to find, is there anything? I mean, we just open ourselves up. Holy Spirit, is there anything that that you want to reveal that I need to confess? And just listen to it and then confess that. A third step is found in Romans 12. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We must surrender ourselves to His control. We surrender our life to the leadership and lordship of Christ through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Having a hunger and desire for God's best, having confessed all known sin, having surrendered the control of our life to the Lordship, we can claim the fullness of the Holy Spirit by faith. We simply need to request the Holy Spirit to control our lives. And I think that's truly more for our benefit than God, because God can read our minds and, and read what our desires and the attitude of our heart. But, but Praying and asking makes it concrete in our mind. We have here in Ephesians 5.18 the command to be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. That's in the imperative mood. That means that is a command. We have an incredible promise also in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It says, this is the confidence we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us in what we ask, he will give to us what we've asked for. The request that we have, ask from him, he gives us. Is it God's will that we be filled with the Spirit? Of course it is. That's what he said. If it's his will and we ask for it, will he not give it to us? Will he not do it? God grants us the filling of the Holy Spirit, not on the basis of our own merit, not because we deserve it, but by his grace. We don't earn the filling. We don't have to beg for it. It may or may not result in particular emotions or feelings. Now, that for, for clarification, speaking in tongues is not an evidence of the filling of the Spirit. That is a gift. God may or may not give that to certain people. The filling of the Holy Spirit is a much more profound principle than any expression of gifts. It is about control of the life. And understand this very important fact. There's only one indwelling by the Holy Spirit when we're converted. There are many, many, many fillings. You may be filled with the Spirit, and then you go out and you stub your toe and you say something you shouldn't say, and you confess it, and you fill it with Him. Sometimes it's like spiritual breathing. Someone has used that illustration of spiritual breathing, you know, it's it's like exhaling the impure and inhaling the pure. And sometimes it's like we're running a race, we're panting. And we ask multiple times in one day to be filled with the Spirit. Spirit, control me. I, I, I took control there. You do your work in me. Many, many filling. In fact, the tense of that verb, to be filled, is the present tense, which means continual action. It's something we do over and over and over and over and continually. And as we learn to practice that confession of sin, asking to be filled with the Spirit, that becomes a habit within us. And we grow. And we're able to have the power that we desire. So the results, by finish, the results of being filled. There are many, there are many, many, you know, uh, things, but let's look at the passage here. Verse 19, it says that we'd be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. You get the feeling of joy. You get the feeling of, of release, of, of uh, 
you know, we're a heart singing in melody to the Lord. And, and note if you're not if you're not a musical person, it says speaking to the Lord in these things. Singing's wonderful if you do it. Not everybody can. It's a gift, but speaking those things, speaking hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, speaking God's will to one another. Always, another thing is always giving thanks to the Lord. You know what, what this reminds me of? It, it, it's the words of uh, John 7, where he says, Out of his inner being, he who believes in me, as scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. An overflow. That overflow from our lives. That affects other people, you know. An, an overflowing spring is is flowing out, and and many people will benefit from it. And our lives will be like that. An overflowing spring is a Holy Spirit, and that's His desire. His desire is to is to affect other people for our lives to be joyful, and and so joyful people are are affected by it. There in verse 20, another result, an attitude of thankfulness, always giving thanks for all things. Now, how can you do that? How can you even give thanks for bad things that happen in your life? Which they do, don't they? It's just having the attitude. Well, Spirit, that that was allowed to happen to me, you know, and and uh, you're going to see me through this. You're going to give me the power to overcome whatever... The results are of this, whatever happened. And we can remain joyful even though bad things happen. That doesn't mean we're always, always happy about them, but joy and happiness are, are much different than you realize that. Fruits of the Spirit, you know, the joy, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, I think those were a package deal. Sometimes we pray for one particular thing, you know, Lord give me patience. But as we're filled with the Spirit, all of those things are ours. The fruits of the Spirit in control of our lives. That's where it comes from. When we realize God's in control, that He's looking out for us, we realize He's going to give us everything we need. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. We don't need to be concerned about things that are happening that are beyond our control around us. Political things that happen and over concern, but we don't have to fret and worry about them. God's in control. We don't need to be concerned about material things. God says, I know what you need, and I'll give you what you need. We'll be able to understand better God's perspective on life. And all of us are looking for guidance in life, aren't we? Lord, what do I need to do? How do I handle this situation? What is your will for my life right now? That's the Spirit. He'll give it to you. He will guide us. God has promised that. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to control of our lives. That's the ultimate and wise behavior. Walk as wise people because the days are evil. But God gives us a perspective on that. We understand that. We're able to see it. Final result here of the filling is submission to one another and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. We're a family, we're subject to one another. We we'll consider others. Is more important than ourselves. The Spirit is the source of Christian unity. When we realize that the Spirit's in control of you, and the Spirit's in control of me, we have unity. That's really very important in marriage. And that's the subject of next week as we talk about our uh, marriage and what Paul was saying about that. So last word of application. The word of God is like a mirror. And we're to look into that mirror and see 
reality. As we look in the mirror of Scripture this morning, regarding the filling of the Holy Spirit, do you see a spirit-filled Christian, one that the Holy Spirit's in control, or do you see a self-controlled Christian? If it's self-controlled, then it's simply a matter of going through the steps, desiring it, confessing any known sin, and then surrendering control of your life to Him. It's a simple thing, not easy. Easy and simple are always the same. But it's a very rewarding thing. God changed my life. I am a witness that I'm here because of this truth, the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I've learned, and as I've opened my life to the Holy Spirit, He, you know, it's been ups and downs and and uh, all sorts of different things. But the Lord began a work in my life. And that's what he desires to continue that work. This may not be a new truth to you. I, I doubt if it is. But we need to be reminded of these truths because it is so vital to Christian living. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he is fully God. We thank you that that. We have this wonderful gift you've given us of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. But Father, we need to realize the fullness of that gift. As you said, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, letting Him control our lives so we can be all that you have made us to be. Father, we desire that. And Father, we pray, I pray that everyone who hears this message would, would consider their lives and say, am I in control, or is the Spirit in control? And to give you control, Father. So we may reflect your glory. Father, as a mirror that is clean reflects it so much better than one that is dirty. We pray, Father, we be clean in your eyes, reflecting fully the glory of the Lord Jesus, realizing your will for our lives, that we might walk in wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your life song.